All right, hey everybody. Um, my name is indeed Peter Corliss. I am the Director of Technical Advocacy at ScyllaDB, which means I get to celebrate a lot of what our customers are doing with our technology and a lot of what our engineers are doing behind the scenes. And so let's get right into this here. Um, as we talked about, uh, we are doing some more events with uh, Stream Native. One of the last events we did was a, a, a distributed systems masterclass, which was all about how to hook up uh, NoSQL systems and event streaming systems. And that was uh, 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 Tim's work, and it was just a really good uh, event. And so you're gonna see uh, Silly to be working a lot more with Stream Native over the coming year. What I want to talk about today, a lot of what you've been hearing about was specifically how things are working in, within Pulsar, but I want to say that the challenge that we have in the industry is to make our databases, our data repositories, more easily hook, uh, um, uh, hooked up to Pulsar. We've already heard a little bit before about how some things don't have connectors, how some things need to be re-architected from the ground up to be more in tune with the event streaming world. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. We're gonna use SillyDB as an example of what you need to do to re-engineer a database to work in the world of event streaming. Uh, this, by the way, this chart here, I could spend a half an hour on it alone. But the highlight I wanna say is that we're in the zettabyte era world. We talked about before a single customer having an exabyte of data, but now what you're also hearing is that organizations are sharing data between each other. So if you're a large enterprise and you might have an exabyte of your own data, you might have other data partners and each one of them may have an exabyte of data. So we need to build systems that can traverse organizations, potentially be multi-cloud and work in theory, at the zettabyte level in the days to come. Of course, the compute itself is getting faster, the memory is getting faster, the storage is getting faster, it's getting denser. Uh, I know somebody who's working on a single rack scale system that has 2,048 cores, and in that rack scale system stores a petabyte of data. This is a lot more than my first Macintosh Plus. And so you need systems that are not only designed to be able to transmit all this data, you have to re-engineer a system to deal with this kind of scale. Because sure, we're used to this concept of commodity hardware, but when your commodity is a server that stores up to 60 uh, gigabytes on a cloud, or sorry, sorry, 60 terabytes on a cloud, that's, that's, not, that's a precious commodity. That's a commodity more like gold than tin. So databases themselves are evolving with what's going on. There's consistency model evolution going on between eventual consistency and strong consistency, tunable consistency. Uh, we, we hear a lot of, uh, today about ACID compliance, but then there's also base, because when you have a globally distributed system, you can't wait for that strongly consistent transaction. Do I really need to wait for a round trip time to Tokyo or London before I process this data? Or do I need to write it now, constantly? And eventually, it'll get to Tokyo. Eventually, it'll get to London, but I need it now. You have data models and query languages are evolving. And I know everybody loves SQL, but it is not the only query language out there. Nobody is writing a graph database that is just pure SQL. It's just not happening. So you have Gremlin Tinkerpop. You have other kinds of uh, languages that are specifically designed for the data models that they're supporting. You have, um, beyond this, the data models themselves are polymorphing. We, we've often heard about like SQL, and I liken that to the old Catholic Church. And then when the Protestant Reformation came along, there just wasn't one Protestant denomination, there was an infinite number of them. And that's what we're seeing in the Cambrian ex explosion of NoSQL, where you have different classes of document stores and key values and white column graph. There's n numbers of different kinds and classes of NoSQL databases. And if we try and pretend that everything is SQL, we're missing the boat. So again, everything that we've designed to work with gigabytes of data needs to scale three orders of magnitude to terabytes, 
another three orders of magnitude for petabytes, another three orders of magnitude for exabytes. Whatever you thought you were doing, it's like the Red Queen syndrome. You need to do it twice as fast just to stay in place. So your database should be designed for the specific kind of data, the specific kind of workload, and the specific kind of queries that you need to make against it. Now, a lot of us become fat, dumb, and lazy, and the database that we learned when we were in college or our first job becomes the database that we always try and throw at a problem. And that doesn't work in 2022. That database may have been designed before the cloud was even invented. So sure, you can use various databases for tasks they weren't designed for, but should you? So for a database to be appropriate for event streaming, my argument needs, uh, says that it needs to be working in real time where real time is defined as milliseconds or less, single digit milliseconds or less. If you're talking about a database that has 100 millisecond SLAs for its P99s or a sub-second P99 latency, that's not fast enough for a lot of use cases. It's certainly not going to work in ad tech. And then the orders of magnitude. Somebody once told me, I was talking to them, they say, yeah, we have a really big database. They said, how many transactions per second are you doing? He say, 10,000. And for him, that was a really big database. And he was trying to say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a real adult, right? But you were hearing use cases all day long where people are talking about 3 million transactions per second. So we can't rely upon yesterday's technology to solve today's problems, never mind tomorrow's problems. So these are some of the things we need to look at when we're even evaluating this technology. Is this database cloud native? Is it something that's going to work where I need to be operating? Uh, it has to have all these illities, all these qualities. So is it scalable? Is it reliable? Is it manageable? Is it observable? Is it does it have a facility? Like, is it easy to use? How many databases do you actually believe are easy to use these days? I don't see any hand up in this room, because none of them are. They're all finicky beasts, and we know the personal pains and struggles we have with every single one of them. Then the question is, was this database designed for this world of event-driven systems? 99% of the databases out there predate event streaming, and they show it. So they still think in terms of batch and not stream. They, many of them don't even have change data capture built into it. It's an add-on you have to buy for the database. Because they never even thought, like, well, who would need to do that? Like, you know, so how, is your technology really up for event streaming? Do they have both a sync and a source? Or many systems only come with a sync connector by default. You have to build your own source connector for it. Uh, and then also, event sourcing. Event sourcing, many people don't really understand it, but it's like you can't just store the current state. You have to go back through every single iteration of change in that data to really do event sourcing. And a lot of people say, well, isn't current state good enough? And for many people, it is. But other people are like, no, I need every diff along the way. I really do need an event sourcing database. And then you need to choose the best fit for your use case. Maybe SQL is totally fine. I need to do tables and joints. Maybe a join is going to be so computationally heavy that you've just blown your SLA doing the join. And so maybe you say, no, no, no. Don't get me down the SQL path. I need no SQL. I need one big table, terabyte sized table. So the query language, the data model, the data distribution, again, are you working in a single data center? Or do you have the issue of I need Tokyo and London and San Francisco all stood up at the same time, all peers, and all active distribution across all of them? The workload is also an important thing. A lot of OLAP databases are read-oriented, right? So you know, you're going to put the data in once, but then it doesn't change, and I just need to run a lot of analytics off of it. There's a lot of transactional databases, great for ingestion of writes, but terrible for reads. 
So what is the data pattern, the data access pattern that you have, and does your system support the workload you're trying to put against it? Then, of course, there's the speed, and beyond all of this, it would be wonderful if all of us could afford all RAM instances for sub-millisecond latencies with infinite amounts of RAM. We can't, we have to live within real world budgets. And so the question is then, of all these illities and all these systems that are available out there that I could be benchmarking against, what will my boss actually approve? So a lot of the underlying architectural limits of these older systems are really apparent in 2022. Strong consistency is great, if strong consistency is what you're trying to do. But again, between here and Tokyo, you're talking about those real world, speed of light limited latency issues. And so maybe, maybe you can relax that strong consistency presumption that you had. Maybe this is an eventual consistency use case you're talking about. Uh, many systems are designed around a single primary server and they come from the old world of SQL mainframes, right? And maybe you had a hot standby. Clustering is a secondary thought. And the replicas may only be for read only, which means that if you have a write heavy workload, you are bottlenecked because only one server in the entire cluster can accept read, uh, writes. So that's not gonna work for a write heavy workload. Um, the local clustering idea, again, goes back to that mainframe thing. I can have as many nodes as I want as long as I'm running in one data center. What happens if that data center goes out? And we had a customer that had one data center burned to the ground, but fortunately they were fully replicated in two others and they lost no data. So these are considerations when you're talking about massive scale and speed and high availability. And I'm not here to argue anybody, if you seriously need a table and a join, stick with SQL or maybe new SQL. But if that's not what you need, maybe you need to take a look at one of the many flavors of NoSQL out there. The other thing again is a lot of people have done shovelware. They had a database, it worked on premises, and they said, well, let's host it in the cloud, and now we're cloud native. That's not the definition of cloud native. You may be a database as a service, but you've just lifted and shifted to the cloud. The question is, are you elastic, like people demand on the cloud? Are you serverless, or do people need to understand the hardware infrastructure they're running on? Uh, do you have easy microservices and API integrations? Is your billing, con are you consumed like a cloud native service, or do you still charge per core like you used to on premises? Right, so the, all of these things go into, what do you mean by a cloud native database? And governance, the other thing too is, I'm in this uh, territory, uh, maybe I have Tokyo, and maybe I have New York, maybe I have the UK, uh, maybe I have also, I need to separate UK from uh, EU traffic, because I have privacy issues. So does your system also support the geopolitical realities that you need to have? So again, what is a database, what does it need to be or have or do to properly support event streaming in 2022. So to my mind, this is my basic list. Yours may, and I want each of you to think about this when you go back to your organizations, what do we need? But to my mind, high availability is a requirement because if my event streaming service can't turn off, if it's churning out events 24 by seven, how can my database take a day off? Right? How can you even take an hour off? You can't tell me there's downtime. So you need to have that, that integration between the two. You also need to have an, uh, an impedance match between the database and the event streaming system. Because what if I had this gigantic, awesome pulsar capable of these single digit milliseconds, and you're telling me that everything is gonna bottleneck when you hit the, the, the primary storage database? That's not gonna work. Or conversely, if this is the place that these events are sourced out of, you can't tell me that it's, it's too uh, small to really pump as many events as it needs to into the Pulsar system. So you need to make sure that these are both kind of built to the same scale, the same speed, the same impotence. 
So I also talk about, I love this term, it was taught to me by my, uh, a mentor I had who used to work at GE, and he says, well, we call this at GE the uh, gazintas and gazatas, right? So do you have your proper sources and your sinks, right? It, 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 is there a way to get the data between these systems that are easy, or is it totally, well, we're gonna have to build this from scratch because nobody ever thought this through before? Because one, you're hitting the ground running, the other one, you're spending a quarter or two writing your own connectors and compiling your own libraries. So I wish I could tell you that SillaDB had all of this magically understood when we first designed SillaDB, but it was a learning journey for us as well. And I think this should be true for any technology provider that you're looking at. See what their journey was to make something compatible with event streaming. So the first thing is we're built on what I call good bones. Uh, Silly to be was patterned after Apache Cassandra. So it is, but it was designed on C++ using a thing called a C-star framework. It's a whole other half hour conversation, but it's basically the shard per core, async everywhere, shared nothing architecture, capable of really using 100% of the service you're paying for. Over and over and over again, I see people's Java consoles showing less than 30%, 20% utilization of the hardware that they're running on. And it kills me because you're paying for 100% of that box. And you're telling me that you're topping out at 30% utilization? That sounds to me like you're overspending by 70%. So SillyDB is a greedy system and it's designed to use every single CPU that you're paying for on your cloud provider. You're getting full ROI on your infrastructure. It's also scalable like Cassandra. You can throw thousands of, of servers at it, and each of those servers could potentially have hundreds or thousands of cores. And it'll scale much more linearly than a lot of other systems. So this is the good bones I'm talking about. It is available like Cassandra, peer-to-peer, active-active. There's no single point of failure. There's no primary that's the only one you can write to. Every single node can be a read or write. Distribution, again, multi-data center clustering is built in. It's not an added, bolted-on feature. Automatic sharding was part of the architecture. So all of these are the good bones. And so to make it compatible with, uh, with Kafka, that's where we began, we take a look at 2020, and, you, and we saw today the journey between Pulsar and Kafka, and if you went back to, let's say, 2017, 2018, and you had a bet as to which technology was ahead, you'd have betted on Kafka at the time. And so we began there, and we created a sync connector. And the sync connector for us was kind of cool because beyond the standard Cassandra sync connectors, we're shard aware, which means that the client is smart enough to know on which CPU the data you're looking for is, and it immediately connects to that node at that CPU, immediately gets to the partition you're looking at. That was kind of awesome for us, and it was about 20 to 25% more performant than a generic Cassandra sync connector. The next thing we needed to do was we needed to add change data capture into SillaDB. It was a feature that was implemented in Cassandra as a log file on every node. So in order to consume it on Cassandra, you had to take each of those log files, get them off the box, and dedupe them manually. Then you could consume your change data capture. We thought we could do that better, and we made it a standard CQL queryable, and we'll get into the implementation of it. And it took us about two years to go from the experimental ver first version to the production ready, took a year, and then to really harden it make it performant and scalable was another year's worth of work. And then in the middle of that, we added the Kafka source connector based on Debezium. And so you can read these articles. If you wanna see exactly how we did it, uh, we'll tell you all about that and you can get it right off of uh, GitHub. So now in 2022, we can say, look, all of this works. You can put your data into a base table, it will be copied into a CDC table, which is consumable by the uh, Debezium source connector out to the Kafka topics and backwards. We can also get data out from Kafka topics and put it into Scylla uh, base tables. We have a customer that's doing that where they have upstream Kafka 
They do a little bit of sideband where they do some data enrichment. They do some enrichment within Scylla, and then they pump it to a downstream Kafka topic. So, so event streaming is all around us. We cannot escape it. And those jobs, I was uh, talking to the customer, they have to do 100 million records, and they have a five-minute SLA to process all 100 million records over and over and over again throughout the day. So it's happening at scale. For us with Pulsar, I do have to admit that we, we need to do some work here. Because by default, awesomely, the, there is a Pulsar consumer, a Cassandra sync connector, that ships by default with Pulsar, but it's not shard aware. So even though we're faster as a basic database, we can make those connections 20 to 25% faster if we had a shard aware Cassandra sync connector. With the Pulsar producer, well, we don't have that. Again, you can use what we had for Cassandra compatibility. We have that Debezium connector for, uh, for, sorry, for Kafka. And then you could use that and then basically wrap that and, uh, and bring that into Pulsar. But these are the two potential developments that we still have on our plate, is that shard-aware native Pulsar sync connector and the CDC Pulsar producer. So how does it work? How did we make this work? Well, first of all, from the user's point of view, it's actually pretty simple. You just say CDC enabled true. And now, suddenly, in the background, there's going to be a shadow table, a CDC table, created underneath your base table. Into that shadow table in the CDC, you can specify whether you want the deltas, so this is what was in the record, this is what changed in that record with this last update. You can also store the pre-image. So I want the complete pre-image in case I need to fall back. Or you can put in the post-image, what's the latest version of it. And in fact, you can choose any of or all of these three uh, changes. So different kinds of event streaming use cases require just the diffs or the pre-image or the post-image. And this allows you to consume it as you desire. <clears throat> The other thing is that event streaming does cost, uh, cost disk space. And unless you had an unbounded amount of disk in reality, you need to somehow capitate your usage of disk. So we put a time to live separate from the time to live of the base table. So the base table has its own time to live, but the CDC data underneath can have its own separate uh, time to live on, on top of that as well. By default, it's set to 24 hours, but you can change it to whatever you'd like. And again, true or false is the flag to enable it or disable it. There is a kind of a log table, and this gets into the metadata that's associated with each of the CDC tables. There's like a stream ID, time stamping, a whole bunch of things so that you can keep track of the uh, exact batch sequence and everything like that. And this is what we wanted to do, is we wanted to be the best of all the implementations we had seen in our peers. So Cassandra, you can see that there's a lot of red here. It wasn't really a heavily thought through solution. It existed, but it was very difficult for consumers to really utilize in production. Again, you had to, there was a, a library to kind of get this data. There was a log file that was created, but the deduping and pumping it into an event streaming system, that was all your homework. DynamoDB, we thought, OK, they're doing a pretty good job. AWS knows what they're doing. But notice how they only had the pre-image and post-image. They didn't give you the deltas. Because uh, Cassandra only had the deltas and didn't have the pre- and post-image. We're like, why not just give them all? Let the user decide which one is the most important for them. So, so this was basically part of what we wanted to do, is we wanted to see like, what's the best way of doing it. If, if we're late to the game, if we're not the first NoSQL database with event streaming, how can we make it the best of all implementation we see it seen? So normally, when you write to, uh, to Scylla, you have all these nodes in a token ring, and you're going to insert into one system. In fact, you're not, uh, sorry, it's not inserting. You, you send the query to what's known as a coordinator node, and then what that does is it sends the data to three other nodes with a replication factor three, RF3. Boom, boom, boom. Three other nodes are chosen for where those partitions will be written to. Boom. That, that's how it normally goes. But with CDC, what you need to do is the coordinators needed to ask, well, did this partition already exist? 
Because if it did, and you had a pre-image or post-image, it needed to first check those, that, that current setting. It needed to read that and marshal that at the coordinator node. Then it would write to the base table, and those diffs or those pre and post images would then be sent to the same node where there's that shadow CDC table on the same node. So you don't have additional writes. They're not, and so the same node that's got the base table also has the data. And then it's consumed by having these kind of streams. And then basically there's a round robin of reading the streams through Debezium. And again, we have a Java, we have a Go implementation, there's Debezium, and that just goes out to a Kafka broker. Uh, if you want to learn more about Scylla and how to use Scylla, you can go to Scylla University. Um, if you want to read more about change data capture and how we implemented it, uh, there's the lesson there. It's all free. It's on Scylla DB University. And with that, I think I'm four minutes ahead of time. <laughs>